OK, <laughs> good. What I had in mind was a one-minute intervention. That was great. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Give my hand. I think he's trying to clone me, or vice versa. <laughs> I can just go home. <laughs> OK, that's enough on cloning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Perry. <laughs> airtime. Competition for airtime. Uh, the 80 20 principle. By the way, you can choose one of these six methods, or you can choose three of them. I wouldn't recommend choosing six of them, but, but between one and three is, is a good number to choose. Um, the 80-20 principle is another way of doing it, obviously. And I don't really need to tell you anything about that, because you've all read the books, <laughs> so that's fine. But I mean, it's, it really means concentrating on the most productive clients, or the most productive profitable products, or the most productive ways of delivering the products. Um, and that turns the whole organization into one which actually is a hell of a lot simpler because it's doing fewer things. There's a kind of consistent theme here, isn't there? That you do less, and you do less the more senior you are, which is great. And then there's automating. And I've chosen there what the South Africans, do you know what South Africans call this? What do you call these things here? Stop lights? Tra traffic lights? We call them traffic lights in England. In, in, in uh, South Africa, they call them robots. <laughs> it's fabulous, robots. I've always thought robot was, you know, one of these futuristic things where you have a factory and there's no people and there's dog and that's, that's all there is. But actually robot's an old word which dates back to the invention of the stoplight. Um, and in the days before they had stoplights or robots, what did they have? And they still have in Latin America today, they have all these people with white gloves sort of waving the, the traffic on. And uh, I think robots are a very, very good expression for this. <clears throat> the point is to automate something. And to automate something means taking a service, and we're all, most of us anyway, not most of us, I dare say a good half of you at least, are in a service business. And it means turning that into a product. And in LEK, we uh, struggled to do this for quite a long period of time. But eventually, we came up with three products. One was a straightforward portfolio analysis. The second product was what we called a relative cost position analysis, where you identified your competitors, and at each stage in the value chain, you identified what their costs were and what your costs were. Incredibly tedious work, but very, very valuable work, which we could sell for a lot of money in the days before other people found out how to collect data. Um, and the third product which we had was uh, analysis of acquisitions and uh, commercial due diligence eventually for the private equity business, which turned out to be a fantastic product for us. But my emphasis was always to say, you know, we are not going to do bespoke business. We will make it look as though it's bespoke business and we will think about it, which is the most valuable thing you can do for, for making it bespoke. But actually, the engine of what we do is going to be these three products. And we're going to train people at each level to do a bit of these. And we turned it into a factory, essentially. And we called it the strategy factory. Um, and if you automate something, you can sell more of it because you say, oh, we'll sell them that. You know, you know what it is that you're going to sell. And you can deliver it at a much, much lower uh, cost not necessarily a lower price, unless you really have to, uh, but automating is a, a fantastic way to grow because you can do more of it with the same number of people. So you can grow and expand, but you can also have higher margins at the same time. And then the final way is to find a formula. For example, the star principle formula, but it could be any formula, etc which is just so much more powerful, so much more profitable, and so much more likely to grow fast over a long period of time, because you've got, in this case, a star business, but any formula that you can think of, and you drive that formula, the formula is what drives the business and makes it very high growth. And of course, in that case, the whole organization, in a sense, 
is off its hamster wheel because it's actually doing something which uh, requires thought and doesn't require lots of flailing and doing and all these other things. So, and that's just a, a, a blow up of a formula. We can do that. So I'm going to ask you to think about this. I'm almost at the end of the presentation, so if you want to go and use the bathroom, hold on, just another 10 minutes. I want you to rank which ways you're going to use. If you're serious about getting off the hamster wheel, you can come up with your own way of doing it, and anyone that's got a seventh way or an eighth way or a ninth way or a twelfth way, I'd be very interested to, to hear that. But I want you to choose one of those as being your main way, and then maybe you have one or two supporting ways. So if we go back to that, basically, Bill Bain's way and Bruce Henderson's way was majoring on disciples, but Bill Bain made the pyramid very much an element of the organization, and um, both of them used formula as well. So, it's very simple. What I'm asking you to think about what I'm asking you to ask yourself is decide if you want to get off the hamster wheel and why it is you want to do that. You remember the three reasons to do it. One is to do other things, specific things that you want to spend your time on. The second way is that you can improve the performance of the organization no end by not having to do it yourself. And the third way is that you can create the value in the company exponentially greater by having an exit, which is when you exit from the business, it's a well-honed machine to make money, and it is not an extension of your own personality. And then decide the three, way, three ways that you're going to use. But make no mistake about it, getting off the hamster wheel is not easy. If you try and do it, it requires not intellectual brilliance. It requires you to actually do it. And there are two ways to do that. One is to disappear. <laughs> this is meant to be the smile of the Cheshire cat and gradually fades away. My artist has created something that looks more like an advertisement for toothpaste, I think, but never, <laughs> never mind. To gradually disappear. So the way you do this is to disappear periodically. Take a day a week and disappear. Don't tell any of your people where you are going. Don't leave your devices, your, your, your phone, your email, open. Don't answer anybody's email, because if you answer one, then they'll tell, tell, tell the other people. You just disappear in the Bermuda Triangle. You can go, you know, go visit somebody, go for a walk on the beach, go for a walk by the lake bit more practical here. Whatever you want to do, but disappear. And then you gradually, like an addict, extend that. So you, you're, you're weaning yourself off work for one day out of five or six, and then you do it for a week. And then it's actually probably better to go somewhere, because then you definitely won't be available. And you make it clear to people that you are not available. So they have to make the decisions. They can save them up until you come back. But what you rapidly find is that they do more and more of what you were doing. You may not like it, as I say, but, but that is what getting off the hamster wheel means. I, I remember a conversation that I had with a guy called Paul Judge. Now, Sir Paul Judge, um, because he gave a whole bunch of money to start the Cambridge Business School. And um, he said to me, the formative experience of my life, Richard, was I went to Kenya. I said, oh, yeah. I went to Kenya as the head of Cadbury Sweats in Kenya, which was a tiny, diddly squat little operation. It made no money because there was a 50% uh, sales tax. And we, being Brits, we told the government what we sold. And all of our competitors didn't. They said that they... <laughs> Their sales are about a quarter of what they were. So we, we could never compete effectively in this market. But anyway, I was the head of, of this business. And I did that for three years. And he said, this, this is someone who is even older than me, believe it or not. There are, they do exist. Um, he said, in those days, 
a telephone call was an incredibly rare event. You had to book telephone calls days in advance, and the telephone lines to Kenya were not very good. And so he said, you know, that was a really, really exciting event when you got a telephone call. <laughs> and he said, there were no faxes, there were no email, uh, there was no way that anyone could contact you. And so I had to make decisions. I was 20, 27 years old or something like that, 25 years old, Paul Judge speaking. And it was a fantastic experience for me because nobody else could do it. I had to do it, and I couldn't ask head office what to do. And he said, that's what gave me the confidence to run, uh, to start a buyout. They, he bought out um, the food business of Cadbury. And he made uh, about 300 million pounds, or rather he and his friends made 300 million pounds selling it to Hillsdown Holdings four years later. And Paul's personal stake in that was about 45 million pounds, which I suppose is uh, about 60, 65, 70 million dollars. So, you know, basically this, and then he could become Sir Paul Judge by giving a bunch of that to the uh, Cambridge Business School. That's, that's fantastic. But the same principle applies that if you are not available, then inevitably you are increasing the responsibility and the experience and increasingly the confidence of the people when you're not there. So one strategy is to disappear progressively, and then eventually you disappear permanently. But it enables you to try out this and to find out whether, in fact, you can get off the hamster wheel or whether you are hopelessly addicted to being an important person every minute of the day in your, in your business. And the other way to do it is what I call singularity, which means that you say, OK, I'm only going to do one thing in this business. I might be sitting in my office, but... I'm not going to be sitting in the office as, as long as I used to be sitting in the office, but I'm only going to do one thing. So for Bruce Henderson, it would be writing these tracks of little perspectives or whatever. Uh, for Bill Bain, it would be running the partners meeting every month where he made sure that he had control by asking people to say whether they've delivered the revenues that they forecast and to forecast the revenues that they were going to deliver later on. But it's one thing that you do, which you enjoy doing and which you're fantastic at doing, and you could get someone else to do it, but you don't want to, which is fine. One thing in the business which you do. And the one thing may be thinking. It may be thinking about the next product, maybe thinking about the next way of getting clients. It may be thinking about um, how to create extra value in the business. So it's a singularity from that point of view. But I say this to you in all seriousness. The only way to get off the hamster wheel is to get off the hamster wheel. A little bit zen there, but you cannot do it unless you do it. And it's one of these things that is conceptually trivial. But actually, in practice, to get off the hamster wheel is very, 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 very hard. It goes against the whole of business culture. It goes against your self-important sense of self-importance. It goes against your fear that if you are out of the business, someone else will seize control of the business. There are ways to mitigate that, uh, some of which I've talked about, and which we can go into later if you want. But it goes against everything that says, I am the business. But it is absolutely necessary if you want to have a really big and really valuable business. You've got to do it. So that's why I'm inviting you, and perhaps publicly, to actually say, I am on the hamster wheel. I believe that I should get off the hamster wheel. These are the methods I'm going to use to get off the hamster wheel. This is the behavioral way that I'm going to get off the hamster wheel. And I'm going to do it by the 1st of January 2015, 2016, or whatever it is. I invite you to think about doing that. Because unless you actually do it, you will have had a nice little seminar here, but it won't actually transform your business. And if you want to do that, you've got to get off the hamster wheel if, in fact, you're on the hamster wheel to start with.